Alrighty ho! Hi everyone! Welcome again to Author Story. I'm Alexander Lim, your host. And for this episode, I'm interviewing Deborah Schaus and also Ron Zoglin. Deborah is the author of the book Connecting in the Land of Dementia, Creative Activities to Explore Together. And for those of you following along who are interested, you can go over now to the Amazon link in the description below the video and check out or get a copy of the book. So, uh, Deborah, welcome to Author Story. Ron, it's our pleasure and our privilege to have you as our guest today. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So let's get on with you first, Deborah. Since you're the writer. What's your author story? Well, um, I got started on the subject of dementia when my mom was diagnosed. Hmm. And it was a period of great uh, grief and confusion initially, as many of your listeners may know if they've been through this. And as a way to make sense of what I was going through, I started journaling. Mm -hmm. So I was already a writer. I'd written a number of books. I was an essayist. And so it was a natural way for me to just come home from seeing my mom and my dad and feel like what is happening and I just started writing things down right. and I decided I was going to find the gifts and the blessings in this journey. Mm -hmm. So I was just chronicling our time together and as an essayist I naturally started turning those into essays mm -hmm. and one day Ron and I were invited to read at a literary gathering. I was a short story writer as well okay. and I said to Ron I'm going to read one of these dementia pieces okay. and he, I was scared. He was a little skeptical. He said, who wants to hear this? And I okay. didn't know. I just I was supposed to read it. And when I read it, all these people came up afterwards and they said, my brother, my mother, my father, my aunt, all these people were going through this, but hadn't really talked about it with anyone. Mm -hmm. And that was a moment that we both understood how powerful it is to talk about this, to share your story. And so um, that was sort of the beginning of my first book, Love in the Land of Dementia, Finding Hope in the Caregiver's Journey. Mm. And that led me to the second book. I, Ron and I share those stories all over the world with different caregivers groups. Right. So we are uh, life partners and we've been caregiving partners too. And it inspired me because what we wanted to do was maintain a meaningful connection all the way through the journey and we did that we stumbled along but um, what I started learning is there are people specializing in this field using mm. expressive arts because after the rational mind doesn't function as well creativity and imagination are still blossoming mm. and so that's what uh, the book is all about I've interviewed dozens of experts around the world who offer their ideas, their leading edge ideas on how to stay connected and engaged. And they've helped me translate these ideas. So any care partner, either a home care partner, a care partner facility can do these with someone who's living with dementia. Mm, cool. Okay. Got that. Cool. So what about you, Ron? How do you get involved in this? I mean, uh, Deborah already mentioned uh, some of this, but uh, how else do you get involved in this? Right. It began with uh, Deborah's mother, of course, and uh, gave me a, an opportunity to um, um, to begin to understand what's going on uh, in the field. And then right on the heels of that, as, as soon as we uh, completed our journey with Deborah's mother, my father um, got dementia oh. and, and uh, that lasted for several years. Okay. And no, no sooner had he passed away, uh, I went through the exact same thing with my mother. Mm. So we had three of our four parents um, involved in this journey. And I feel, first of all, grateful that um, I had all of the background of Deborah's uh, thinkings, writings, and research uh, by the time uh, it was something that I had to go through with my parents. So uh, there was, I guess we could say there was kind of like less uncertainty uh, when you had to go through it with your parents compared to like, if you didn't know what Deborah had gone through first. It helped. It helped hugely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What's really uh, um, uh, interesting to me is the changes that have been made in the field 
even since the uh, short period of time a couple of years ago uh, when the last of my parents passed away. And that is all these all new, amazing, creative uh, techniques and innovations that are now available mm. that I wish were around for each of our three parents, but um, we are having great joy spreading the word uh, what is available now for those who are facing the same thing. Right. Okay, cool. I got that. I got that. So let's talk a little bit about the book. Can you tell us a little more about it? What's it what it's all about? Yes, the whole purpose of the book is to help people stay connected throughout the dementia journey, and it offers inspiration and hope. Hmm. One of the things that Ron and I felt as we were, you know, supporting our um, parents and since then other loved ones who are living with dementia is what, what we really want, what we want with all our relationships is meaningful moments of connection. Hmm. And those are quite possible uh, throughout the dementia journey. The creativity often heightens as some of our filters um, lessen. And so our experts we talk to are using art, music, gardening, technology, cooking, movement, poetry, storytelling, all these things wow. to stay connected and engaged. And it's for both people. Hmm. So if you're a family care partner, you know, the arts help you maintain um, cognitive alertness. So it's good for everyone. It gives you something to share. It equalizes your relationship. It reduces anxiety and stress and just offers you those elements of hope and surprise and discovery that we all like in our everyday lives. Mm, okay, I got that. Very interesting. So what made you decide to write uh, Connecting in the Last Dementia? I mean, was there any part, I mean, I know you wrote a book prior to this on the same subject, but was there any particular incident or realization that made you think, you know, maybe I should write about this? Well, that's a great question, Alex, and there was. Ron and I were screening for the Kansas City Film Festival. Okay. And a movie came in called Alive Inside. Mm -hmm. This is a documentary that documents the groundbreaking work of Dan Cohen from Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. who started a program called Music and Memory. And the idea is that if you find a person's favorite song, songs that really resonate with them, mm -hmm. and you put them on a listening device like an iPod shuffle, and if they're in a place that has noise, you give them headphones, and you turn this on, the music will connect with them. And this documentary, Alive Inside, documents that. It's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. When I saw this, I thought, I want to write about Dan Cohen. Okay. So I pitched the idea to a magazine, and they said, this is interesting. What else is going on in the field? Okay. Well, I started researching, and I came up with all these interesting people, and that was the moment that I thought, I want to write about this. I knew that uh, being a care partner to someone living with dementia was a very creative experience, and so and, and a spiritual experience, and these activities even heightened that. So that's what got me started. And every person I interviewed for this book inspired me, excited me. And I'm hoping that when the readers pick this up, they'll feel the same way and have lots of options for really staying engaged and um, connected. Mm. Okay, cool. Interesting. Got that. So you mentioned you did research for this book. How, how much research exactly did you do for this? Well, that's a great question. What I did primarily, I mean, I did background research, seeking out people, reading some studies, but primarily I talked to the experts in the field. Mm. So I interviewed people, some people I was able to see in person, mm. some people I Skyped, but I mainly spent time finding, reaching out to different people. It was a very organic process where I'd ask each person, who else should I talk to? Mm. Um, and I also researched on my own interesting things that were going on. So it was a rich process doing this. I'm actually still doing it because it's so much fun to do it. 
you know, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I even felt it with my own mom, who I knew very well. Okay. But sometimes you feel awkward or you don't know exactly what to do when, you, when you're spending time with someone who's living with dementia. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you're used to, you know, my mom and I used to sit on the sofa and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. When that really no longer worked for us, that kind of conversation, we were starting a new kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's an exploration to do that. And these kind of creative activities help with that. They give you something mutual to do together, and they take you away from feeling, oh, why can't my mom talk to me like she used to? Okay. And you know, part of the wisdom we got from all the different people we talked to is the importance of just really what we all want. We all want somebody to accept us as we are. Right. And when someone's living with dementia, they deserve that honor too. We need to accept them as they are, where they are, we need to journey to where they are and not try to drag them back into whatever our version of reality is. And right. so that is definitely a spiritual practice. And if you you know, have a family member, that takes a while mm -hmm. to do that. Right. Okay, cool. I got that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, let's face it, even with, even with uh, dealing with family members who don't have dementia, sometimes the, the journey getting to where they are, it's, uh, it can be rather interesting. <laughs> well, you are, you are so right, and, and I love you bringing up that point, because, Alex, one of the heartbreaking things is the social stigma that can go with living with dementia. Yeah. I think it scares people. And so the more we all work together, and just that thought that you just had, um, the more we all share our stories and um, really treat each other as we all want to be treated, we all want meaning, we all want deep relationships, we all want to have fun during the day and stay active and engaged. And that doesn't stop just because you're living with a cognitive impairment. Right, okay. So let's get, uh, let's go a little bit into the subject matter itself. I mean, dementia. As you mentioned, there's a stigma attached to it. Uh, the world, the word itself is very emotionally laden. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. like it conjures images of people just sitting in a chair and just staring off into space, or even of you know burned out families just dropping off their afflicted loved ones because they can't handle the situation anymore. First off, what is this condition or basket of conditions called dementia? I like the way you said a basket of conditions because you're right. Dementia is the umbrella term. So, um, you know, one analogy is you go into the ice cream store and dementia is ice cream okay. and Alzheimer's is Rocky Road. Okay. So, so there's an umbrella term that covers many different types of cognitive impairments and um, as they say, if you know one person living with dementia, you know one person living with dementia because okay. everybody is so different, just like we are, are with any kind of um, challenge mm -hmm. we have to meet as life goes along. Mm -hmm. Okay, you mentioned Alzheimer's being just one of these kinds. Oh, what are some of the other different kinds of dementia? Um, well, there's Lewy bodies dementia, and there's a whole list of what um, the, one of the best places to learn more about the different kinds of dementia, Alex, is to just go either to the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, mm -hmm. their website, mm -hmm. or the Alzheimer's Association has mm -hmm. a big website, and your listeners can read up on the different kinds. Okay, cool. So uh, right there. Uh, what are the websites again, just for our, the benefit of our it's, listeners? Uh, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Okay. They provide um, support for families of people who are living with dementia and people who are living with dementia across the country, mm -hmm. as does the Alzheimer's Association of America. We're lucky to have a lot of support systems here. Cool. Nice. So, uh, both of those. And, um, you know, we were very helped in our journey with our local Alzheimer's Association here in Kansas City. Hmm. So if people hmm. don't have any support, it's really great to reach out. Um, there are support groups, but also it just helps to talk to someone who really understands uh, what you're going through. 
And your listeners will be happy to know there is no charge for any of their services. Okay, got that. Yes, that is a good point. <laughs> All right, cool, got that. Okay, so uh, connecting. This is part of the title, and it really isn't a word that's associated with dementia. How did you figure out you can connect with the people in this condition? Did you ever experience this in your own personal experience, or did you just like learn it from the from the uh, people that you spoke to when you were doing research for the book? We learned it very deeply from our personal experiences. Okay. And um, what, as I was saying a little bit earlier, once we learned to just notice what we had and not yearn over what we lost, it was, we had many, many amazing moments of mm. deep connection with all of our parents. And now we are, we have friends who are living with dementia. We continue to stay connected with them. You know, I'm just going to give you one really fun little example. Cool. And this, this is an example, and I'm going to ask Rhonda help me out with this. This is an example from dear friends of ours. Okay, Who Go ahead. actually, um, when they met each other, Charlie was living with dementia, and he hadn't worked up the courage to tell Elizabeth, and they fell in love. And they married um, her knowing she was living with dementia. They're an amazing, beautiful couple. Ron, will you just share this quick little story? I'd love to. Well, as her husband, Charlie, moved deeper into dementia, Elizabeth Miller bought a cookbook from his teenage years, the 1960s. Mm -hmm. They read through the recipes and highlighted the ones Charlie remembered his mom making. Okay. Then... With Charlie as her sous chef, Elizabeth made dishes such as chicken cacciatore, tuna casserole, and spaghetti and meatballs. They invited Charlie's childhood friends over for a meal, and they talked about old times while they chowed down on Johnny Marzetti casserole. So that's just one of the examples of how you can stay connected through, first of all, you know, a little reminiscence talking about food you used to love. Food is so important to most people. Right, right. And then working together in the kitchen, adapting so that everybody feels comfortable with the task. And what I learned um, from Rebecca Katz, who is the author of a number of cookbooks, and her dad was living with dementia. Her dad loved to be in the kitchen with her, and he loved to stir, her risotto was his favorite dish, so he loved to stir the risotto. But she said even when he got to a point that it wasn't quite safe for him to be stirring the risotto, okay. he loved to sit in the kitchen, he loved to be part of the energy, he loved to sit down to a meal with he had witnessed making. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways to keep people engaged in the kitchen and also gives a sense of purpose because when you get to help create a meal for someone, that feels really special. And so to connect over food that you've helped create is something really easy that people can do together, but it's also quite meaningful. And what's so encouraging uh, today is there are so many of these creative techniques uh, that are now available that uh, Deborah, uh, neither Deborah nor I knew about mm. back in the uh, in the earlier days. And one of the great things that Deborah I think has done is uh, compiled so many of these uh, in her uh, book. You can virtually turn to any page and find something that will inspire. Right. I guess I should I guess I should also mention Deborah has a blog, dementiajourney.org, mm -hmm. and she offers weekly tips. And of course there's no charge for people to sign up for the blog, receive these new ideas uh, as they come out on a weekly basis. All right. Okay, cool. All right, I got that. Uh, dementiajourney.org. Okay, I got that. Okay, so you mentioned that, you know, uh, cooking is one of the creative techniques used, but you, I think you also mentioned earlier something about music or art or something like that. Absolutely. So, what, so uh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, so what is it about these techniques that enables such a connection with people with dementia? Well, music is just an easy connector for all of us. There's something um, Dr. Conchetta 
um, Tamano, who um, is one of the pioneers in music and neurologic um, memory, says that most people respond on some level to their favorite music. Hmm. And so to play music together that is meaningful to that person is a really wonderful and easy way to connect. It can bring in generations. There is a wonderful uh, program called Conductor Size that um, conduct maestro David Dworkin created. Mm -hmm. And it's when you listen to music and you take your fingers or you take a chopstick or a pencil and you conduct along with it. It gives you some exercise, lets mm -hmm. you move to music. There, um, one of the people I interviewed loved to take his wife on drives like they used to when they were recording right. and listen to old <laughs> on the radio. And so that was something they did. And then singing. There's been a recent study by um, Dr. Tepo Sarkamo out of Finland about the power of just weaving in singing into your everyday life mm -hmm. and how soothing that is to sing together. So again, these are simple things, but they're profound and they're good for both people. Mm. Okay, nice. Okay, so there's a connection right there. So, what is the most surprising thing you found out while you were while you were writing this book? Well, I think the surprising thing was just the breadth breadth of ideas and activities that you can explore, and also I was reminded how much alike we all are, and it just expanded my thinking. Um, <coughs> sort of the golden rule is, you know, you treat others as you want to be treated. Right. And that I think is a very deep part of dementia. Another important concept that I knew, but um, I think is a really, was really helpful for me is just this idea of open-ended questions. So a lot of times people who are struggling, you know, who can't remember something feel put on the spot, right. don't want to respond right. um, to a direct question if they don't remember, they feel uncomfortable. Um, so if you have open-ended questions um, like, tell me more, um, what would you do in this situation where you don't mm. have to remember, really opens up conversation. And I think that's what we want to do. We want to keep conversations flowing. We don't want people to feel like they're going to be corrected or make a mistake. Right. I think we can imagine how that feels. Right. And I, th I think for me, uh, the biggest surprise was that the creative and imaginative parts of the brain remain uh, even when it appears that um, the cognitive portions have disappeared. Right. And so people should no longer assume that when they see someone who is not communicating in the old ways that they were once capable of doing, hmm. that there is nothing there and that there is no way to reach that person in a actually very delightful and deep way. Hmm. All right. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Got that. So uh, let me pose this question to, to the both of you. Um, let's say you came across someone who's had a family member who was recently diagnosed with some form of dementia and who is feeling rather overwhelmed, wondering about their own future ability to cope with the impending situation. And you had only enough time to tell that person one thing about how to handle the situation. What would be that one thing you would tell him or her and why would you tell him that? What a great question. I think if I had um, one thing, it would be to get the support that you need as a care partner and take care of yourself mm -hmm. because I think that is the very most important part is caregivers feel um, isolated. They feel they have to do everything on their own right? and there is a lot of support and, you know, I was surprised, kind of, I felt I was a super daughter having to do everything for my mom in a certain way, even though my dad was part of the equation for m most of her life. But often a friend would say, hey, let me go with you to spend time with your mom. It was such a delight to have another person there and really appreciate my mom 
I had gotten used to her and wasn't appreciating her sometimes as much as I might have. So that, that whole thing of reaching out, taking care of yourself, sharing your stories and what you're going through, I think those are the most important things for me. Okay, cool. Got that. And uh, Ron, uh, what, what would be that one thing that you would tell that person? Oh gosh, it's a it's a frustrating question because okay. there are literally so many possibilities now that are available. <laughs> I right. guess I, I I guess I would say open Deborah's book to any one page and you will find something astounding that <laughs> is is sitting there waiting to be tried. I guess um, if I wanted to um, uh, be a bit more generic. I can say perhaps humor and flexibility are mm. two of the keys that have kept um, kept myself and I think Deborah um, in good stead every time we have encountered anyone uh, who is dealing with uh, dementia. All right, cool. All right, well, great words right there. So, uh, Deborah, Ron, uh, in the last few minutes of this interview, are there any last words of wisdom? Uh, you would like to share to inspire listeners anything at all well for me it's just to really appreciate the the journey you're on with that person it's the meaningful journey it can be frustrating but it's also a journey of great personal growth and so as much as you can to appreciate it and when you can't appreciate it to figure out how to take a break to get some renewal for yourself so you're going back uh, as fresh as you can be. Cool. Uh, Ron? Oh, I would love to leave uh, those as uh, my famous last words, the ones that Deborah has just expressed. I, I think that says it all in a nutshell. All right, cool, fantastic. So then, in closing, our guests have been uh, Ron Zoglin and author Deborah Schaus. The book is Connecting in the Land of Dementia, Creative Activities to Explore Together. And the website is DementiaJourney.org. You can also find the book on Amazon or on other online booksellers. So Deborah, Ron, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for being an author story. It's great to have you with us as our guests. Thank you. We just love talking to you. It's been a real pleasure. You're welcome. Of course, for those of you listening, if you want to get Deborah's book, Connecting in the Land of Dementia, Creative Activities to Explore Together, you can get it right now by going to the Amazon link in the description below the video. And if you'd like to follow our author interviews on YouTube, yep, it's easy, just click on subscribe. So, so long for now everyone, but I'll be back on Author Story next time with another inspiring author. <music>